Hello and welcome to our Grands Rounds presentation. We are going to be presenting to you on the anti-vaccination movement in the United States. Our presenters include myself, Hilda, Marie, Maya, Abigail, Stephanie, and Clara. We are going to be addressing uh, the nurse's role in immunization, how we can provide our patients with uh, the, the right type of education and how we can combat this movement and prevent any re-emerging disease. The objectives of this presentation are as follows. Discuss origins of the anti-vax movement. Debunk myths associated with the movement. Discuss consequences of the movement. Establish the APRN's role and the interprofessional collaborative approach, and determine ways in which we can combat the movement through education and other methods. In this section, we're going to talk about how the anti vaccination movement took hold. Do you know who developed the vaccine for smallpox? That's right, it was Edward Jenner, and we're going to talk about him first. Widespread vaccination began in the 1800s and ever since then, uh, anti-vaxxer groups have also been prevalent. Uh, this pictured here on the left is Dr. Edward Jenner. He was a physician in Britain and he worked around uh, livestock. And so he, uh, he is attributed with developing the smallpox vaccine. And he did that by um, taking the pus off of people's lesions that had contracted cowpox, a animal version of smallpox, and he would put it into an open wound of a child that he was trying to treat. And eventually that led to active immunity and uh, developing vaccination. So uh, actually the word vaccination, the root word is vaca, which is Latin for cow. And so, um, that was in 1796. Now, uh, even back then, um, so about 50 years later, they enacted the Vaccination Act of 1853, which ordered mandatory vaccination for infants up to three months old. And that's when the anti-vaccination uh, leagues and groups started at that time. Their, their version of conspiracy theories was that if people receive these vaccines that they would develop cow-like traits. And then moving on to 1970, there was a uh, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccine controversy that started in a, uh, a hospital in London where they alleged that 36 children had developed neurological conditions following the administration of a, of a DTP immunization. Uh, that did not become public in the U.S. until about a, 10 years later with a, a documentary called Vaccine Roulette, and uh, that was alleging adverse reactions to immunization. Probably the most relevant to our lifetime has been a study by Dr. Andrew Wakefield. Well, he's, he's no longer a doctor. Uh, he had his license revoked. And as you can see here, this is a images from his now retracted study where basically, as you can see in the highlighted text, he had connected uh, the MMR vaccine to autism and that uh, took off hugely here in the United States and was the basis for a lot of the claims that were being made um, by celebrities and politicians and, and um, the public. It's important for the advanced practicing nurse to remember that fears surrounding vaccination continue to be spread today and now they're reaching more people because of the different technologies that we have. Uh, we're going to play a short clip of different celebrities that have an impact today in the anti-vaccination movement. We do not need that many vaccines that we need. The chickenpox, I think, can be a parent's choice the rotavirus, the flu shot, 
that still contains mercury. I am totally in favor of vaccines, but I want smaller doses over a longer period of time. Because you take a baby in, and I've seen it, and I've seen it, and I had my children taken care of over a long period of time, over a two or three year period of time, same exact amount. But you take this little beautiful baby and you pump I mean, it looks just like it's meant for a horse, not for a child. You can't make, um, you can't make people do procedures that they don't want. The parents have to be the ones who make the decisions for what's best for, my, for, for our kids. It can't be the government saying that. It's against the Nuremberg laws. I have not yet to find any scientist who will say that there's no doubt, no doubt, that the mercury in vaccines does not contribute to autism. Now, they'll say there's no scientific evidence, there's no studies or anything that, that, that proves that yet. But turn that around. There are no studies that disprove it either. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie. I will be going over myths versus facts regarding vaccination information. There, are a lot, there is a lot of misinformation regarding vaccines, and it's important to be aware of the misconceptions about vaccines in order to debunk incorrect information. Perhaps the most controversial reason parents choose not to vaccinate is the fear that vaccines such as MMR um, can cause autism. This widespread fear was published in a study conducted by Dr. Andrew Wakefield, who was a British surgeon. Um, this article was published in the prestigious medical journal called The Lancet, and it suggested that the MMR vaccine caused or was contributing to autism. Since the study was published um, in 1997, it has been completely discredited due to ethical violations and serious procedural errors that happened and occurred um, within the study. Um, although the study was discredited, the hypothesis was taken very seriously and is still impacting our children today. According to research data, most vaccination reactions are very mild, with serious adverse reactions only occurring in one per thousand to one per million doses. With people questioning the safety of vaccines, the next question of concern is whether or not vaccinations are worth the risk. Often, people choose not to be vaccinated or vaccinate their children because they believe that the vaccination that they are receiving will cause the disease that they're trying to prevent. We often hear this rationale for vaccines such as the influenza vaccine, when in fact, the symptoms that the patient may experience is just the body's immune response to the vaccine, which is exactly what the goal is when providing vaccinations. The next myth is that we do not need to continue to receive vaccines because the infection rate in the United States is so low. This is important because there will always be a portion of the population, such as infants, pregnant women, elderly, and those with weakened immune systems that can't receive um, these vaccinations. The last point I will be covering are misconceptions regarding ingredients used to make vaccines. Many vaccines contain ingredients that, that concern people such as aluminum, formaldehyde, and mercury. While these ingredients can cause harm in toxic levels, the amount contained in a single vaccination are only found in trace amounts and are approved by the FDA. My final slide shows data regarding reemergence of diseases that are vaccine preventable. In the United States, pertussis, measles, mumps, and meningococcal disease are the most prevalent in children and adolescents. Now let's talk about the role of advanced practice nurses and what we can do as APRNs.
in the mission to provide evidence-based information for patients, specifically parents of infants, young children, preteens, and teens, the CDC has created informational flyers such as these that are available for providers to provide to parents in both Spanish and English. These fact sheets have been developed by the CDC, the American Academy of Family Physicians, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. These not only address frequently asked questions, but also when and why such vaccinations are needed so that patients can make informed decisions. Another role that nurse practitioners can play in combating the anti-vaccination movement is to lead vaccination implementation and creation programs, such as the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or the ACIP. Members of the ACIP create recommendations for the CDC to create U.S. adult and childhood immunization schedules. Members consist of 14 experts who are experts in vaccinology, immunology, and various specialties of medicine. And to make 15 members total, one member provides social and community aspects of vaccinations. Nurse practitioners should also stay up to date on immunization information with continuing education. You Call a Shots is an interactive training course for providers to stay up to date on latest recommendations for vaccines. These modules cover a wide span of vaccines, including Hep A and B, HPV, influenza, meningococcal, MMR, pneumococcal, polio, rotavirus, Tdap, and others. Hi, my name is Abigail, and I will be discussing how we, as advanced practice nurses, can help combat the anti-vax movement. So what are some ways that we can combat the movement? So we all know that social media and news media is the way to get out information to the most amount of people. And we know social media especially is where a lot of people get their information. So using social media and news media to provide information against the demonization of vaccination is key to getting this information out. According to a qualitative study, parents' responses to media messages and decision-making regarding vaccination was impacted by personal experience, value systems, and trust in their healthcare providers. So that's when we come into play as advanced practice nurses, helping establish that trust with our patients or with the parents, if we're discussing a child, so that they know that when we recommend a vaccine, it's coming from a place of knowledge and also knowing the myths that are out there so that we can properly educate them and make them feel at ease and that what we are recommending and their decision is going to be founded in truth and in facts. Educating on facts and figures and debunking myths. So that goes along with the trust in the healthcare providers. But earlier, Stephanie also discussed different myths and facts to debunk them and encouraging your parents and your patients to do their own research from valid sources so that they know what myths are out there and what the truth is behind those myths. Because there's so much information out there, so there is a risk with empowering them to research themselves that they can come across more information, but you as a provider should be educated and know how to educate your patients as well as relieve them of those fears that they may have regarding vaccinations. And potentially introducing legislation that promotes and mandates vaccination. So we hope not to have to get to this point because everyone does have the right uh, to decide what they would like done to their body or to the body of their child. However, when it comes to protecting our patients and the world as a whole, it is important to educate patients and their parents of the risks of not vaccinating and the fact that there are diseases that are re-emerging that we thought were eradicated or nearly eradicated because of the use of vaccines. 
So education is key. So another way that we can combat this movement is through the use of inoculation messages. So just a little bit about what an inoculation message is. So the idea is that you tell someone a myth about a topic, but then you also tell them why that myth, myth is false through a fact. So you're giving them essentially contradictory messages, but you're equipping them with the information to know that when they hear these negative or false claims, that they're not true and what makes those claims false. So there was a study conducted regarding HPV vaccination and they used inoculation messages and they found that they were effective in safeguarding individuals' initial perceptions of safety and behavioral intentions regarding vaccinations from attacks aimed at negatively altering those perceptions. So these participants were told, these are the things that you're gonna hear as to why you shouldn't get an HPV vaccine, but these are all the reasons that those reasons are not true and why you should consider receiving the HPV vaccine. So the use of inoculation messages can be very beneficial in combating this movement. Hi, my name is Maya Stancil. I am going to speak about the role of education in regards to the anti-vaccination movement. We have already touched on just the role that we as providers have in giving education to our patients. Um, I'm going to just fill in some kind of broad strokes, uh, some perspectives that may assist us as we consider those that come into our practice. Now, generally, we think about the anti-vaccination movement in regards to parents and caregivers of children, but I do want to stop here and just recall that when we speak about vaccinations and our responsibility as providers, we're speaking about uh, the infant and child population, as well as adolescents, as well as adults. So just to uh, reiterate, uh, we definitely want to build rapport with our patients as well as with their caregivers and parents to listen with great respect, with uh, providing time and space for questions and to acknowledge caregivers' concerns. On this, as a side note, uh, with someone who is quite adamant about not vaccinating, this may just require more visits or a larger amount of time given to adequately have these conversations. As far as routine care, it is our responsibility as advanced providers to do the following. Uh, provide the risks of vaccine preventable diseases, to provide information on the risks and the benefits of immunizations, to document all of that, including caregivers and patients' questions and concerns, to document what exactly has been provided in regards to information and education. And then each practice may do this a little bit differently, but it has definitely been recommended that a practice would have a refusal to vaccinate form or some kind of sign off that a patient and or parent caregiver would sign off on each time they refuse to vaccinate. The journal article cited here by Balestra uh, makes this point as that is part of our legal responsibility as advanced providers. Okay, I'm gonna begin a little bit more here uh, into psychology really and some psychological studies that have been done that show some specific attitudes of anti-vaccination and anti-science. Uh, Hornsey, Harris, and Fielding have done some excellent work in regards to anti-vaccination. And that's where some of this material comes from. And I find it actually really helpful for us to, if we have paused and considered where the person in front of us is coming from, to try to match a methodology to assist them. So, 
Cornsey and Fielding actually have done a lot of work in what's called attitude roots and the attitude roots that relate to anti-science and the rejection of scientific evidence. So there's a lot here and I'm also realizing that this is a live issue just in regards to the COVID-19 pandemic and a potential vaccine uh, being available to healthcare workers and you know potentially the public in the coming months. There's a lot being written about, talked about, that sort of thing. So um, let's start here with uh, these three attitude roots of conspiratorial beliefs, uh, reactance, or disgust or fear of needles and interventions. So conspiratorial beliefs in regard to science um, have some recognition, but what these researchers have found is that change can potentially be created when uh, providers are able to align with their the ideology of of the adult in front of them and then to tailor the intervention to that ideology the second one of nonconformism or reactance uh, what that means is if someone considers advice from others an intrusion so it really has to do with uh, conforming and someone having a resistance to conforming to a norm. Uh, the third one that we'll take up is generally a disgust or a fear of needles and just kind of that the intervention within the body. So what this would look like in regards to an adult or you know, patient or caregiver who is presenting to you with a belief in conspiracy theories and their relationship to vaccinations would be to align with that person in regards to simply acknowledging that conspiracies are possible. And how this would work out is to actually show that yes, vested interests uh, can conspire in order to hide the vaccination benefits and to exaggerate the dangers. So vested interests being a person or a group that can stand to gain um, financially or otherwise. So it's allowing that adult in front of you to, to hear that, yeah, conspiracies can happen. In this case, those with the vested interests for themselves are going to hide the benefits of vaccination and exaggerate the dangers. So if you uh, find out that really the, the adult who does not want to give the child vaccines or does not want to take it for themselves really is a nonconformist, is, is reacting to that, uh, what you can do is potentially align your message with the fact that in anti-vaccination movements, they typically have a high conformist stance. They actually want all within that movement to conform to anti-vaccination. And so individual difference and freedom is actually discouraged within that movement. So it's kind of just pointing out an inconsistency, um, of course, gently and respectfully. Now, when it comes to disgust or fear, uh, you can characterize the avoidance of vaccine as actually a short-term avoidance. And um, this would be to remind uh, the adults of the consequences of disease. And simply put in terms of disease symptoms, uh, hospitals, potential hospitalization, treatments, and the like. Now, as I did mention, this is a live issue. I found another uh, widespread article on CNN 
just this week, and it spoke about the term vaccine hesitancy and is actually exciting that one in five children in the U.S. has a vaccine hesitant parent, according to the study. And what is meant by vaccine hesitancy is the mental state of holding back in doubt or an indecision regarding vaccination. And what one of the professors here in Atlanta at Emory, Dr. Henry Wu, he brings up this last methodology that if you are truly considering you don't want that vaccine in your body, you want to avoid that, consider what a hospitalization would be like if you were actually ill with one of these preventable diseases, how many uh, medications and how much um, would be infused in your body, what that actual impact would be. So we're seeing other experts utilize these methods as well. So in summary, in regards to education, we all want something that, that works um, for the good of our patients and is not um, terribly frustrating on our behalf. So one other source here is Dr. Swingle out of St. Louis, Missouri. He again emphasizes just how important that provider-patient relationship is. And he places such a high value on that because the whole issue of trust is at the center and at the core, really, of what we do and um, must have some existence in order for a caregiver or patient to go from being, you know, hesitant to, to changing their mind and taking a different course of action. So, of course, uh, the value of listening and really understanding where they're coming from is essential for that. Uh, Dr. Swingle also points to that at a societal level, uh, his opinion is that we need provider leaders to engage the issue, to not become activists, but instead to articulate very clearly the consequences of being unvaccinated. So I take that as, as quite a challenge, honestly. Um, we have also seen in the research that some providers do this in their practices and it has actually uh, brought about different decision making for parents and caregivers of children when they go through the consequences of not vaccinating with methods such as showing pictures of children with vaccine preventable illness, such as mumps or measles, and uh, providing firsthand accounts from parents of children who have a vaccine preventable illness. So there's a lot of decisions to make as providers of how, how we want to lead our practice and, and what to do with each individual patient, parent, and caregiver that we see. One thing that I don't wanna discount as we move into professional practice is just that we share resources and share stories of what has worked and what has not worked among one another. Uh, we have all these relationships that we have gained in school and I hope that we can take that to the professional level and help one another as we go along. Thank you so much. In that vein, I will say that I am a nurse practitioner student, uh, not currently, in practice on my own yet, but uh, this CDC fact sheet is one place to start, one resource um, that uh, many others have pointed to, just that outlines, at least in brief, understanding risks and responsibilities of a parent and caregiver who chooses not to vaccinate. So that's our starting place with finding resources that work or do not work. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marie Bell, and now we will discuss the interprofessional collaborative approach for immunizations. Multiple disciplines and organizations are listed, which either provide or educate for vaccines. 
Informatics includes the documentation system or registry that is used across states and nationwide. This is connected and provided through the CDC. It is also called IIS. VFC is the Vaccines for Children program, which is federally funded through Medicaid. WHO, the World Health Organization, provides us with objectives for 2020 and 2030 healthy people. Subspecialties include pulmonology, cardiology, uh, endocrinology, and multiple other disciplines. Transportation logistics involves shipping and handling from the manufacturers to uh, offices and administration locations. The ACIP, as mentioned before, is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. The NNDSS stands for the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System, which monitors for many of the diseases vaccines are aimed to prevent. Travel clinics will also assist with the less popular vaccines or less available. Internationally, marriage counselors are also involved in recommending vaccinations. Within interprofessional collaboration, what role do we each play? The number one predictive factor for adult vaccine compliance is a provider recommendation. That recommendation should be clear and strongly communicated using presumptive language instead of conversational. Most clinicians will also refer to a health department or pharmacy when that vaccine is not in stock. Each encounter, regardless of the facility with a patient, is an opportunity to assess their immunization status based on the online record or registry, recommend a needed vaccine or educate the patient, as well as administer or refer to a clinician who can. Providers do not recommend or refer for vaccination often because they assume insurance will not cover the cost or based on prior experience that their patients will decline. For those who did stock vaccines, a lack of re reimbursement is the primary reported reason that they no longer do. Across the disciplines, how are we doing then? How are we excelling? Compared to 10 years ago, 62% of children are now receiving their flu vaccine, as shown in 2018 to 2019. Also, more than 80% of advanced practice providers are now assessing for, recommending, and administering the flu vaccine. 93% of pharmacists are administering the vaccine, and 91% of pharmacists also stock the shingles or zoster vaccine. Over 90% of OBGYNs and over 75% of family medicine are also recommending the HPV vaccine. Pharmacies have proven to be an excellent resource because of the extended hours and convenient and abundant locations. So what are some ways that we can improve? Currently, only 53% of clinicians and pharmacists are documenting in IIS or GRITS in Georgia. Also, less than 58% of primary care offices and internal medicine are stocking the shingles vaccine. The shingles vaccine is also only covered by Medicare D and not B, which does not reach all of our elders. 48% of subspecialty offices do not stock the flu vaccine, and only 38% of pharmacists are recommending the HPV vaccine. Even though OB patients are indicated to have flu and Tdap, the OBGYNs are less likely than internal medicine to stock these vaccines. Therefore, only 50% of women received the flu and Tdap in 2018. Integrative medicine clinics are also the least likely to administer vaccines at 44%. As part of interprofessional collaboration, it's important for us to use and benefit from each other's strengths. Our elders, or those over 65 years old, are already using pharmacies for their chronic medications. Therefore, pharmacists can positively impact their access to pneumonia, flu, and herpes zosters immunizations. 95% of elders see their specialist annually, but these specialists, as noted before, are less likely to stock or refer for immunizations, assuming that their patients will receive it elsewhere. However, less than 66% of elders see their primary care physician annually, and up to 80% of primary care doctors are not discussing at least one immunization with their elder patients. Within schools, the nurses will confirm their vaccinations with the IIS registry or GRITS. Kids are more likely to receive their flu vaccine when it's offered at school, 
versus having to make an additional primary care or pediatrician visit. However, school vaccine is also more costly per child, but when considering the time saved from parents taking off work, it could uh, be beneficial. As noted earlier, the reason parents are hesitant with vaccines of their children includes vaccine safety, their belief in its efficacy, the perceived risk, and social norms, as well as the trust in their information sources. The majority of vaccines for children are provided at their wellness visits or preventative. Another large percentage is provided exclusively as an immunization or nurse visit. Episodic visits contribute also towards their vaccination. In the subspecialty of cardiology, patients who receive their flu vaccine have a lower rate of major adverse cardiac events. However, only 48% of cardiovascular disease patients in 2016 received their flu vaccine. We see an increased likelihood for those who are hospitalized. In OBGYN patients, it is the first time moms that are the least likely to accept vaccination. In a survey of Georgia and Colorado mothers, only 56% intended to receive their flu and Tdap vaccines. While some offices do not stock, it is shown that it is not cost prohibitive to stock or administer vaccines in OBGYN offices. It is still the provider recommendation and the availability in office that remains the highest indicator for acceptance by patients.